Well, it's time to talk about swords and sorcery fantasy games again, which gives me a chance to put on one of my old costumes from my college days when I did live action role playing or LARPing. Uh, but before we go there, we need to talk about something. Now this, this is a book, and this is the Oxford English Dictionary, and I shall read a definition to you. The word is doll. Doll. Definition number two. An image of a human being used as a plaything. Doll. Doll. Anyway, because I don't want to deal with thousands and thousands of hate mails from many of you who've already sent them to me, I shall use other terms in the word doll to describe these things. I will use miniature figure, a sculpt, a fig, whatever you call it. The games we're going to talk about on this episode of Board Games with Scott, many of them are jammed packed with them, like the good old Descent, urgh, full of all sorts of doll miniatures. And Castle Ravenloft, the board game. And Dungeon Quest comes with all these great little figures. Um, this one, Those Pesky Humans, does not, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But on this episode of Board Games with Scott, we're talking all about the Dungeon Crawl. Hi there, this is Scott Nicholson, and welcome to Board Games with Scott. This is a show where I analyze some aspect of the board gaming hobbies. I take several board games and look for some theme or explore something they have in common in order to help folks understand the design implications or what's going on with games and culture, really to explore this concept of board games. And so in this episode, I'm going to be tackling the Dungeon Crawl game. Now, Dungeon Crawl games come out of a role-playing tradition from Dungeons & Dragons. In Dungeons & Dragons, hang on, this, all this fantasy stuff is hot there. <sighs> In Dungeons & Dragons, many times you would get together with a group of stalwart adventurers and go delving into the dungeon to defeat monsters and get lots of cool items and stuff. And so you would use your miniatures on a little map and you'd move them around the map and you'd fight the bad guys. Someone playing the dungeon master would tell you the tales of what's going on. Now they've tried to capture that in board games and they've done a lot of dungeon crawl board games over the years. The goal of this episode is not to cover all of them. I'm only gonna cover four of them and compare the aspects that are different, talk about the implications they have on design and the play experience to really explore some aspects of the dungeon crawl. They are very similar in general. The basic concept is you have a group of players. Most of the players are playing party members, exploring a dungeon, looking for treasure and defeating monsters along the way. In two of the games, there's one person who takes on the role of an adversary who plays the role of the monsters. In the other games, the game plays the role of the monsters, perhaps employing the players to make some choices and take some actions along the way, but there's not one person against the others. Now, one of the overall challenges with this type of game is that coming from the role-playing game tradition, a role-playing game was not designed as the dungeon master versus the players. Instead, it was about the dungeon master providing an experience for the players. And so the dungeon master had the ability to adjust the game as the game went along, to adjust the difficulty, to make things work well, to tell a good story. Sure, a dungeon master will kill off characters every once in a while, and, but you generally only want to do it if they deserve it, if they did something stupid. These games don't have that kind of mercy. That's not built in. Instead, they'll just smack you around and you get to see if you survive. So I'm going to be talking about four games on this episode. Two of them are fairly similar in a lot of ways. We're going to talk about Descent, which has been out now for a number of years. Uh, it's put out by Fantasy Flight. It is the most lavishly produced of what I've got here. It's also the most complex. And Those Pesky Humans, which is a relatively new uh, game that's very similar to Descent in that both of these have one player who plays all the monsters against the players. This one actually is presented as a two-player game, but the idea is that if you have more than two players, you can divide up the heroes amongst uh, some of the players. So it, it does end up being working very well as a number of players versus one person playing the bad guy trying to fend off those pesky humans. So we're going to talk about Descent and those pesky humans. We're also going to talk about a fairly new game, uh, the Castle Ravenloft board game, which takes some of the rules from Dungeons and & Dragons and simplifies them. And this is a cooperative game where you're all working together to try and beat the game. And the game has you play the bad guys from time to time. And we're going to talk about Dungeon Quest. Dungeon Quest, this is the reprint by Fantasy Flight Games. This is a competitive game where each of you is playing a hero trying to get in, get stuff, and get out. Now, what do these games all have in common? Well, the basic structure of the game is as follows. The heroes have gotten together for some unknown reason and are deciding to work to enter some kind of a dungeon space, which will probably be gray and dank. Uh, they're going to go into that dungeon space, which 
many times has some artificially inspirational flavor text that the one person is supposed to read. Um, but the basic goal is to get in, get either stuff or kill someone, and get out. That's what you're trying to do. So in these games, each player takes on the role of a character. The character is going to have a set of statistics about them. It's going to describe their physical attributes, how strong they are in combat, how fast they can move, how many hits they can take before they die. Uh, there may be some special abilities or magic or melee or, or ranged abilities tied into the character. They all handle that a little differently. But the basic concept is you have a character, and the characters tend to fit into traditional uh, archetypes. You have your warrior who's going to run up front and beat things up. You have your rogue who's going to sneak around and pick locks and stab, stab, stab in the back. You have your magic user or your wizard who's going to stand back and blasty, blasty, blasty with spells. You have your priest who's going to run around and heal people and keep them from dying. You may have a ranger who's good at shooting arrows and dealing with animals. Uh, you may have a druid who's good at the animal stuff. Uh, so you have these archetypes of, of characters that you're going to see represented in many of these games, and the abilities are related to the archetype that you have. So the players go into the dungeon, and typically on a player's turn, they're going to be able to move. That'll be dictated by a, a, some ability of the character in most of the games. And then they can attack if there's some monster that's sitting out there. Um, and so a player will move and attack and can en also engage with the board if there's a treasure chest to open or a door to deal with or something like that. In the games that have a dungeon master or some, someone playing the bad guys, and the bad guys will go, and all the bad guys will get to move, and they will get to attack. And again, there's variety on this structure in all these games, so that's basically how a lot of these play out. You move, you deal with the impact of your move, you deal with an attack if you're fighting something, and then the next player goes, and the next player goes, and then the dungeon master goes. And you continue taking turns, alternating around, until you achieve your objective or you all die. So that's the basic concept. Now, Dungeon Quest is a little different than this. In Dungeon Quest, you move, you deal with whatever you've just stumbled into, and your goal is to get as much as you can and get out, and to try and be the last person standing. And so it's a little different than the other three, which are all about a group of people going in and trying to do a quest. In Dungeon Quest, you're all competing, trying to run in, get stuff, get out, and survive. However, Dungeon Quest is also very deadly. Uh, there's a very small chance you'll actually survive the game. So many times the winner is the only person who managed to get back out before either the dungeon collapses because it only goes for so long, or they all just die from the bad things that happen to them. Some of the other things these games have in common are treasure. So you're going in for loot. You go in and as you fight things or open chests or wander around, you find items that help improve your character's abilities, that help you fight better or live longer. You might find potions that allow you to heal. You might find just money that allows you to spend it back in town and do something like that. Uh, so you'll find treasures and items. They all contain traps, which are surprises that will do some damage to you. Uh, they all produce monsters randomly. So that's another thing about all of these games is you don't know when you're starting the game what you're going to encounter. And so a big challenge of the game is being ready for whatever you run into. And so they all use some way of t drawing cards or tiles that indicate when you have to fight a monster. And sometimes those monsters don't come at convenient times. All of these games, as published, are designed as one-shot adventures. You go in, you have your adventure, and then it's done. Descent has come out with other rule sets that allow you to have a campaign that goes on over time, more like a traditional role-playing game that goes on over time. But all of these games, as they are, are designed to be played in one seating. You play through the game, you have your adventure, you're done. Now, let's get into some of the specific differences, some of the design choices that are made between these games, and talk about how they change the flavor of the game. First, we'll talk about the structure of these games and how that changes the atmosphere of the game. So in Descent and those pesky humans, you have one person playing the bad guy and everyone else playing the heroes. And what this creates is an adversarial situation, where it's a one versus many play situation. You have one person who's trying to kill off all the heroes, and all the heroes are trying to accomplish some sort of an objective, or they're trying to kill off all the bad guys, or whatever the scenario dictates. And so these games end up creating a, a, a one versus many situation, which some people may not like. Uh, you may not want to sit down and play a, an uneven game, where it's me versus all of you. Um, now, there's some people that like to play the me, 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 all about me, um, while other people don't like that idea. And so if you don't like that idea of one versus many, you want to look at the other games that, I've put, that I'm offering up here. 
Now, Castle Ravenloft, on the other hand, feels similarly to the ones I've just talked about. You're going in as a group, you're wandering through this dungeon, um, and the players take on the role of the bad guy, basically. They share that responsibility. It's a cooperative game, though. So it's a very different spirit. It's very much a, hey, we're all in this together. Let's kick the bad guy's butt. Hooray! Um, so the way it splits up these responsibilities is that after you move and you attack, you either have to flip over a new tile showing more of the dungeon and introduce a monster, which you draw a card for, or you have to draw an encounter, which is some random bad thing that's going to happen to you. One of those two things are going to happen every turn after the player goes. Now, if you draw a monster, that monster goes in front of you. Then what happens is, from that point, including that turn, every time it comes around to you, after you do your turn, you then move all the monsters that you revealed. Um, it's actually a little more complex than that. I'm not going to go into those details here. But it's a very clever way of distributing the bad guy roles around the players so that everyone's playing a little bit of the bad guy. And it means the bad guy's going all the time because he goes whenever a player goes, the player then has to make the bad guy go. So it's, it's a clever way of dealing with the fact of not having a dungeon master there causing you grief. Or you go the other way and you go completely competitive with Dungeon Quest. There's four people entering to compete against each other to try and get stuff and escape. Now Dungeon Quest, the way it deals with uh, the, the bad guy is two ways. One, there's a clock. Every time the first player takes a turn, you advance a token on a clock. And when that clock hits the end, then the dungeon collapses and everyone dies. There's actually in this game, unlike its original predecessor, um, there's a die roll that determines when the dungeon collapses. So the game technically could go on forever if you roll a six every time you come around to that clock. Um, but most likely that's not going to happen. And so this game has a timed ending. You have a number of turns, 24, give or take a few, to get in, get stuff, and get out. The other way this does it, whenever you encounter a monster, one of the other players picks up cards and plays that role of the monster. So for a short while, that player is playing the bad guy. And that player does have a reason to try and kill you because this is a competitive game. So you're trying to work against the other players. You're trying to get in, get stuff, and get out, and kill off the other players when you get a chance to play the role of the monster. So the tone of these is different, and that may dictate which one you want to select. Whether you want to have one versus many, you want to have everyone together, or you want to have everyone against each other. Another difference in the structure of these games is the scenario basis. So in Ravenloft and Descent, the games come with sets of scenarios that you set up the world based upon a specific scenario and you run the game according to the scenario. The scenario will have a story, why you're going there, what it is your goal is, how you know if you've succeeded. In the other two games, Those Pesky Humans and Dungeon Quest, there is no scenario. In Those Pesky Humans, the goal for the heroes is to get into the, the lair, find three treasures, and get out. And the goal of the uh, evil guy is to kill all those pesky humans. In dungeon Quest, the goal is to get in, get stuff, and get out, and be the person with the most money who survived the dungeon. So those two games don't have scenarios. Now, when you put this together, the implications for design are as follows. In games where you have one player versus many, you have to work really hard to create balanced scenarios because you want to make a fair gaming experience. You want to set it up so that both sides have a chance to win. Now, what you may do is set it up so that it's unbalanced, but say that in the instructions. You may say, this is a really hard scenario for the players to get through. So if they need a challenge, this is going to be one to give them a challenge. In those pesky humans, they made one scenario, basically, and the goal was to try and balance that single scenario. In all of these games, they're really set up for you to design your own scenarios or go online and find scenarios that other people have created. They're worlds that have scenarios affiliated with them. Dungeon Quest gets away with just being unfair. Dungeon Quest is like having a dungeon master who's eight years old and spiteful, and you just broke his yo-yo, and he's out to get you. And so the game is going to try and crush you in many unfair ways, to the point that you may die in the first turn of the game. That can happen. But you're all going in, and you all know this going in, and you should be aware entering this game that it's highly deadly, and part of what you're seeking is this chance of survival. Not necessarily a heroic victory out, but rather who can come crawling out and happen to make it through this chaotic funhouse. Um, so there isn't a game balance in Dungeon Quest at all. I, one person can draw and get a bunch of of money, the other person can draw and die. Um, and that's part of the experience that you're getting into. So each of these provide a different experience. I'll talk more about that later. Now let's go into some of the mechanical areas of these games and how they differ. <laughs> So in each of the games, the heroes are going to have a lavishly produced hero card. 
looks something like this. And you can see in all of them, they all have some sort of statistics and abilities that represent their strength, that represent their, their power in combat, that represent their ability to defend. They all have different special abilities. They all have some sort of name. You have Esper the Righteous and Arjan, Dragonborn Fighter, and Roman of the Wild, and Hugo the Glorious. And so in each of these games, and by the way, this is Dungeon Quest with Hugo. This is Descent. This is those pesky humans, and this is uh, Ravenloft. So you start out with, with these statistics, and in some of the games you have the ability to improve your character in different ways. Uh, the way Ravenloft does it is you can spend experience that you've gotten to flip your character over, which gives them more abilities. In some of the other ones, you get cards, which will add to your character's abilities. Now, the heroes are represented by miniatures in these games, and for me, I'm not a big person into painting miniatures, so I can't tell you about the difference in detail. These are from, uh, that is from Ravenloft, that is from uh, Dungeon Quest, that is from Descent, and that is from those pesky humans. See, no difference at all. I just can't tell between all, oh, wait, okay, never mind. Those pesky humans doesn't come with any miniatures. Instead, what they've chosen to do to save money are to create cardboard cutouts with little bases that you slip in and off. Which, by the way, these things are really annoying. If you're not careful, you'll end up pushing the base through some of the cardboard and kind of ruin that. So you have to watch as you put it on. And that brings me to one of the absolute worst design choices ever. Hang on. You people who made those pesky humans, I need to talk to you about something because you've annoyed me. Now, this is a door in those pesky humans, okay? That's fine, looks like a door. You put the door out. However, in order to know if the door is locked or unlocked or trapped, you have to pull the door off of its little stand where it tells you at the bottom what's going on. This door is trapped. The problem with that, as I earlier mentioned, is it's very easy when you shove these little cardboard things into these plastic doodads to rip the cardboard, to tear it up as you're sliding it in and out and in and out. And in this game, every time you open a door, you have to pull the thing out. What were you thinking? Arrgh! Anyway, sorry, back to the discussion. So, as far as the characters go, you know, the basic concept is the same. The Descent is the more complex game, as you can tell by the amount of stuff that's on the character. And with all of these, except for Dungeon Quest, the characters are all going to have cards that go along with their character sheet. Uh, the cards are going to give them other abilities, so magic spells, or things to shoot, or tricksy moves, things like that. In Dungeon Quest, you're just basically this character. Good luck on that. We'll see how long you survive. Now, from a design perspective, a lot of players like the chance of customizing their characters. Uh, and so in all three of these games, the players start with a base character, but then you get to customize them with skills and abilities that apply to that character class. And that means each time you play the game, you can play someone that's the same character but slightly different. Uh, so for example, in uh, Ravenloft, what I found is that the ranger class typically uses a bow, but you could choose to take no range skills and just take close-up skills and to play the character totally different than if you took a character that's shooting things at range. So that's a cool customization thing that a lot of players get into. Now, Descent actually released rules to continue the game as a campaign. So you start out with this character, and then you have the ability to get better and better and better as the games go on. So it may be you choose a game based upon the sort of character development you want to have. None at all, you just collapse from where you started. A limited amount of, of customization, but no character development, or some character development, or very advanced character development. So now let's talk about how the world forms, how the dungeon is made. Uh, dungeon Quest is different than the others, so I'll talk about it first. So in Dungeon Quest, what you do is you pick a direction you want to move, you point to a space, you pull a tile at random, you flip over the tile, and you put it so your character's walking over the little arrow, and that makes your dungeon. And then based upon the room you've drawn, you draw a card. It could be a trap tile, which definitely has a trap. It could be a corridor, which lets you go, go running on through to the next room. And one of your goals here is to try and, oh my gosh, it's a collapsing thing. And one of your goals is to get to the middle and get to the dragon treasure and get back out. Now, one of my favorite rooms in the game is this one, the bottomless pit. You pull that, you roll to see if you pass your agility. If you fail, you die. Thanks for playing. And I have seen in games, first draw, I'm going here, I step, I fail, I die. Ah, everyone laughs. Ee hee hee. That should tell you right there if this is the game for you. <laughs> 
If you think that's funny, you think that possibility of it happening is amusing, then this might be a game you want to check out. If that is appalling to you, then you may want to pass on Dungeon Quest. The other games are all a little different in how they put the world together. In Castle Ravenloft, the way it works is whenever you get to the edge of a tile, then you, you have a big stack of these little tiles. You flip one over. Again, you put it so you're walking over the arrow, like so. And then you, you can, whenever you see a pile of bones, you bring a monster into the room. And so bad guy will appear there. And that's the way that the world unfolds. It's randomly. And so then you move in. When someone's at the edge, you flip over another tile. And so you'll have this dungeon. Now, all of the dungeon tiles in this game look pretty samey. They're all basically gray. They may have some symbols on it used for some and special uh, things during certain scenarios. They all have a bone pile on it. Um, some have corridors, some have walls, but they're all pretty similar, dull, dingy, gray dungeon. Uh, the way that Descent works is it's very customizable. And so the scenario will show the game master how to put together the room. So you have tiles with different types. You have different types of terrain on these tiles. So when the players go into a room, you look at the map, you assemble it, you, you show them where the doors are, you show them where the treasures are, and you put out the monsters and they have to go in and deal with it. Finally, those pesky humans has tiles like this. So there's 10 tiles like this. Each one is double-sided and you randomly select which side you're going to play with. The, side, the, the tiles all have entrances and perhaps exits. Many of the tiles have places where treasures will go. And in this game, the way it works is the bad guy sets up the entire lair first. So the bad guy determines randomly which side of the tiles are going to be used. They take the 10 tiles, they set up their whole lair, they determine where the bad guys are going to be, they determine where the good guys start, and then in each of the lair tiles they put one treasure token. On the bottom of three treasure tokens contain the three gems the players need to get in, get, and get out. But the others all have bad stuff, traps and nasty things like that. So it's up to the, uh, the bad guy to set up a nasty little dungeon as part of the setup for the game. And that's kind of cool, actually. That's a neat way of getting the game ready. So the bad guy gets to set up the whole space. So now a big part of these games is combat. So let's talk a little bit about that. So first, the bad guys. So the bad guys are indicated in the games through different ways. In Dungeon Quest, you draw a card with a picture of the bad guy, then another player chooses at random a little token, and the token tells them how many life points that bad guy is going to have, in this case six. But they keep that a secret, so the player doesn't know how tough the bad guy is until they defeated them. So they have to go into combat and choose to continue not knowing how tough that guy is. Um, the other games are all similar in that the monsters are represented by cards. And just like the players have cards, the monsters have cards with special abilities, move, attack, defense, special abilities, what they can do. Uh, what the way Descent has done it is you have figures that are white and figures that are red, and the reds are always tougher than the white. And so the symbols here tell you how tough the bad guy is. The way those pesky humans work is the bad guy gets these cards, which they play, which allows them to bring on the character. Um, and then... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons uses these cards. Now, if you remember in that game, the players play the monsters, and what you do is you draw a monster. Now, what's interesting is the, the cards have instructions on how to work the monster. So, when you follow a monster, you're going to follow their tactics. If the spider is adjacent to a hero, it attacks that hero with a venomous bite. Then it gives you the statistics for a bite. If the spider is within one of the hero, then it attacks the closest hero with a web, and it gives you the instructions for the web. Otherwise, the spider moves two tiles toward the closest hero. So you just follow the instructions, and then it gives you your statistics and what it's worth if they're dead. And this is a really clever way of doing the game. So each monster has different instructions. The nasty thing about this game is that if two of the heroes have pulled spiders and they each have one of these cards in front of them, whenever either hero goes, they activate all the spiders on the board. So the more of the same type of monster you get on the board, the more frequently they activate and the more quickly they kick your butt. Now let's talk about how the combat happens. So in most of the games, they use some sort of randomization method. Uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, you use the traditional D20. So you roll a D20, you're going to add the D20 to your attack number. In this case, the monster has a plus six. You're going to compare it to the other guy's armor to see if you break the armor. And then you'll do damage if you successfully break the armor. So that's the way it works. It's based on a D20 roll. Um, in the, uh, those pesky humans, same idea. Each side, though, just rolls a d6 and adds it to their total. So what's interesting about this is that this creates a much smaller range for combat than this does. There's a lot more movement in here to let the characters get stronger and weaker because a plus one 
in a system with a d20 is much less impressive than a plus one in a system with a d6. So when you're using a d6, you have to be careful about overpowering the characters or the monsters by giving them bonuses. In a d20 system, you've got more room for flexibility. Now, Descent also uses dice, but they use funky dice. These dice have all sorts of different symbols on it, and they're different colors. Based upon the strength of whatever it is you're fighting with, you use different colors of dice, and different colors indicate different strength. And so some of the dice are weaker than others based upon their color. The way it works is based upon the attack you're using, you're going to roll a number of dice as shown, and you're going to look at several different things on the dice. First, you're going to look at numbers. The numbers tell you the range, how many spaces away you can hit with that attack. Second, you're going to look for little lightning bolts. Little lightning bolts are like special powers. So many times if you get so many little lightning bolts, you can use them to do different things. And then hearts. Hearts indicate the amount of damage that you do. So what it'll do is you roll a bunch of dice, you see if you're in range, you see if you get to activate any special abilities, and then you see how much damage you do. However, there's always the risk of rolling the big X. If you roll the X, you miss no matter what else you roll. So that's a danger of piling in too many dice, is you really raise that chance of rolling one of those nasty little X's. So it's a clever system. It is much more complex than these systems. But there's a lot of variety you can use with the dice system. Uh, it's a clever way to quickly deal with range, hitting, and special abilities. The disadvantage of this system is you never really know what your character is going to be able to do until you roll the dice. With these systems, you select what your character is going to do. You have powers in front of you. You say, I want to do this, I want to try this, I want to do that, and you do it. Range is already determined. You know if you're in range or not based upon the character's abilities. With these, you don't know if you're in range, if you're shooting. You don't know what's going on until you roll the dice. Uh, and so this method I find to be less predictable, uh, yet the players end up spending a lot more time debating if they're going to do certain things because they're going to say, well, if I do this, I could take a risk at that happening and that happening and blah, 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 blah. It's like, I just roll the dice and get on with it. Anyway, Dungeon Quest uses a very different system and it uses these cards. Now, a little rant here. In the first edition, the early editions of Dungeon Quest, it was a very simple rock, paper, scissors system with the player having an advantage on one of the three symbols. It's like it's rock, paper, scissors. However, if the player uses rock and the, other, the bad guy uses paper, the player does two points of damage, otherwise it's one point of damage. But other than that, it was rock, paper, scissors. Very random, but very fast. Worked well. Now they've introduced a card-based combat system, which takes a lot longer. And I think this is a problem with Dungeon Quest. You're going along, it's quick, you move, you draw, you flip, you deal with the tile, then you get a fight. And now you slow down and you have to deal with this fairly complex, in comparison, combat system. And so the way this works, it's still at its core rock, paper, scissors. But rather than rock, paper, scissors, you have the colors. You have red for melee, you have yellow for magic, and you have blue for missile. Now, based upon the character you have, you get to draw one character special card, which gives your character a little special advantage. The monster, though, also gets to draw a special card, which gives them a little advantage. Then you're going to pick a card each side face down and show it. Uh, you're going to first compare numbers. Whoever has the highest number wins. Three beats two. Three wins. However, if they are tied, then you look at the rock, paper, scissors element. And on each of the cards, it's got a little symbol over here to show you what it beats. So melee beats magic, and missile beats melee. Therefore, if they're tied at a three, the missile wins because it's beating the melee. The other thing you check then is for a successful counterattack. So even if the number is too low, in this case you compare four beats one, four wins and does damage to the other player, but you see that this color matches this color, therefore they get a successful counterattack and they get to do a damage as well. So the rock, paper, scissors is still in effect because you're going to first compare the numbers and then the loser has a chance to do a point of damage if they happen to get the uh, guess right as far as the rock, paper, scissors part of the combat goes. There's also a thing with death blow where as the time goes on the combat can get more deadly, but I'm not going to go into that here. So the, this element, it's, a, it's, it's complex for the game. I think it's too complex for the game. In all these other games, combat is actually simpler. You grab dice, you roll dice, you count up your pips, you're done. Here you're choosing cards, you're comparing, and combats go round after round after round after round after round. So the system in Dungeon Quest, I think the, the older system was superior for the type of game that it is. So my, my design point from this is try and make the complexity of the system in balance with the game that you're putting in place. If you have a light game, then you want a light combat system that doesn't require a lot. Roll a die. 
take damage, move on. If you have a more complex system, like Descent is this very tactical game with a lot of choices, then having a lot of choices on dice, it's okay, it fits. But if it's a simple go and beat things up, just roll a die and add or roll two dice, uh, that's a much better way of handling combat than trying to make it more complex than it needs to be. So now I'm going to talk about each of the four games and the overall experience. How do they feel when you put all these things together? Descent is the one that's been out the longest. And so Descent, the way it feels, is like a tactical miniatures battle game. Because there's a lot of complexity in what's going on. There's a lot the players can do. They can actually do more than just move. The players can wait and see. They can set up ambushes. They can make a lot of choices as to how they're going to use those actions. The dice system is quite complex. Everything is more complex in Descent. And what I find is those complexities slow the game down to the point where it takes a very long time to actually carry out a battle. That what happens is the players begin to talk about things because it is very tactical and there are a lot of decisions that matter. The players will talk about, well, you step there and then you step there and then you do this and then you do that. No, 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 you step there and there and there. When players get to that point of being so tactical, I just want to pull my beard out and say, no, let's just play the game. You're the fighter. You do what a fighter does. You make that decision. Uh, so for me, it drives me a little nuts when I'm with a group that gets very tactical, but the game wants you to get that way. The game is really designed to be that kind of hard, crunchy, tactical game. And because of that, it takes a long time to slog through a dungeon. Um, and that's my problem with the game, is, is the pacing of it. The pacing of it is quite slow. But if you like that idea of a tactical miniatures fantasy combat game, then Descent would be the game you want to look at. If you like, of all the games, it's by far the deepest, the one that you can develop your characters. There's expansions out there which let you do large-scale scenarios. Um, and so there's a lot of depth you can explore if you're okay with that level of pacing. Uh, as compared to Those Pesky Humans. Now, Those Pesky Humans is on the other scale. It's a much, much lighter game. And part of the reason why it's much lighter, in Descent, the uh, overlord, the bad guy, generates these threat tokens as the game goes on. And these threat tokens, he spends them to unleash nasty stuff on the players. So he'll draw cards and then can spend these tokens to do nasty stuff. So he can't do the nasty, nasty stuff every turn. He has to wait and save up. And you have these choices as the overlord. Do I spend a few tokens to do something a little nasty? Or do I spend a lot of tokens to do something really nasty? So you have to make that decision. In those pesky humans, the bad guy's drawing cards every turn, but there's no cost to those cards. So they can play as many as they want. So in Descent, the bad guy has to play one monster a turn. They can't continue to spawn and spawn and spawn everything they draw. In those pesky humans, anything the bad guy draws, they can play. So you can get this little daisy chain of monsters tell, pour, pouring out of the, uh, the, the bad guy's home. Um, it's a much more random game. I compare it to Munchkin. I say if you're playing with people who enjoy the game Munchkin, those pesky humans would be a great next step into this type of game. One thing you do in the game is you draw cards at the start of your turn. Now, overall gameplay rule in any game that asks you to draw cards at the start of your turn, I suggest you draw cards at the end of your turn instead. Why? Because it speeds up the game. If you draw cards at the start of your turn, you draw your cards, you look at them, you say, oh, I just drew this. Now that changes all my plans and I have to rethink things. Instead, if you draw cards at the end of your turn, then when it's not your turn, you can make your plans, you can take your action, you can do what you're going to do, and then you draw your cards at the end and begin to plan your next turn. So my overall suggestion in any game, if you're drawing cards at the beginning, take a look and say, could we have you draw cards at the end of the turn and see if that speeds up gameplay considerably. Most of the time, that works pretty effectively, and it would work effectively in this game as well. The artwork is very cartoony, and so it's going to appeal to you or not based upon if you like this kind of thing. You know, it's not like the other games which have all of the more, I'm big fantasy swords and sorcery guy. This is more like a comic book, and it, it plays kind of like that too. So if you're looking for a very light dungeon crawl experience of everyone against the bad guy, I'd go for those pesky humans. Since there aren't miniatures in there, it's a cheaper game. And so it's also simple. It's not a lot of complexity. Uh, the bad guy gets to have some nice planning going on, setting up traps, which is probably the one place where you set the difficulty of the game based upon how mean the bad guy is in setting up that space. If you want to create a game that's a little easier, then you try and make it easier for the players to get to the stuff. If you want to make a hard one, you can really make it torturous. But just like Munchkin runs on after a while, I felt that those pesky humans ran on after a while. I got tired of it after a while. I was ready for the game to end. 
comparing the other two. So uh, Dungeon Quest is a ride. The game is going to punish you. You know it. You're getting into it. You know you're going to get beat up, and you're going to see what happens. So it's a game of misfortune. And you're hoping at the end to be able to laugh about it. But it's really a ride. You don't have a lot of strategic choices. You are just seeing what happens to your character. And so you've got to decide if that's an experience you want to have. Um, it's if, the, if you are OK not having control, making a few choices, and seeing what happens, watching the miserable life of these adventures as they stumble in like Laurel and Hardy into this dungeon like buffoons falling in the bottomless pits and laughing about it, then it's a game you might like. Uh, if you want to have more control about what's going on, then it's a game you should avoid. Dungeons & Dragons, the board game there, that's a new board game, and I think there's a lot of promise here. In its initial delivery, some people complain about the blandness of the dungeon, and the underlying design is very clever. The way that they're breaking up the bad guys' roles amongst the players, so that the bad guy's always doing a little bit. Um, the way you work together, you can work through more and more difficult scenarios to see if you can make it. I've played it, and our group has died, our group has lived, you know, it, it, it goes both ways. Um, as you get into the harder scenarios, it is a challenging game. You do have to work together. And sometimes, again, it's just the luck of the draw. So in some ways, it's kind of like Dungeon Quest in that the games have to get you. And sometimes you're just going to get big encounter, nasty monster, things at the wrong time, and you all just die. And, and you just have to deal with it. That life isn't fair sometimes for these adventures. Uh, but you're all working together. You're not up against someone. And so it's fun to enter that dungeon space together. It's not a very complex game, and the disadvantage of that is the rules in some places are not very clear. That's been another big complaint of it. There's a lot of things in the rules that are ambiguous. They've tried to make the rules short, and in making the rules short and less technical, they have become ambiguous at times. There's some times where you really need definition, or you just make a group decision and say, we're just going to go with it and ride the ride and see what happens. So that's both a good and a bad. The good and that's simple to get into, the bad in that there are going to be situations when you play where your group's just going to have to come up with the rule that you're going to use and you move forward. And you know what? That's fine because this is your toy. And that's the thing about all of these. These games are about play. These games are about telling a story, about playing make-believe in these dungeons and stomping around. They're, they are about playing with dolls. That's what we're doing here. These are just toys. They're for fun. And so when you're playing any of these games, the nice thing about them is they're really game systems. You could tweak the rules, change them around, change them to make them something that your group wants to engage with. That's the beauty of role-playing games and these sorts of games. If you play something like Puerto Rico, it's all been well-balanced and well-tuned. And if you say, hey, let's play a game where coffee is free and see what happens, you're probably going to completely break the game. But in these sorts of games, in these dungeon stomping games, you can tweak it. You can play with it. You can make it your own. And that's one of the cool things about it. Um, there's also, as you can guess, a lot of room for design. There's a lot of room for you as a, a budding game designer to take a shot at making a scenario for one of these. Uh, buy the Dungeons & Dragons game, make a scenario for it, post it on the web, get some feedback. There's a lot of room for doing that kind of customization. You can make your own bad guys, you can adopt things. There's a lot of creativity that can happen in these games, and that's a cool element of them. So that brings us to the end of another episode of Board Games with Scott. Uh, perhaps this has inspired you to strap on your garb, head down into the dungeon, and see if you can loot the treasure and beat up the bad guys and save the world. Hooray! Or at least make yourself a little richer in the process. But don't forget, if there's darkness there, shoot your magic missiles at it. That's what's good to shoot. And watch out for those gazebos. They'll get you every time. Anyway, take care. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. on Twitter or Facebook, you can keep up with me there. I have one feed for my life and my, my games and things like that, and a second feed for miniature game reviews. Come and join me. Because we're going to be talking a lot about dolls in this episode, because we're going to be talking about dungeon crawling games like Descent and Ravenloft. And my microphone just got ripped off of my chest. Crap.